Hi everyone, I'm Charlotte and welcome back to Ex Situ, Operation Wallacea's new series of online lectures. This week we're heading over to the world of marine biology and introducing our Head of Research, Dr Dan Exton. Dan is going to tell you about a piece of research he started as a student and carried on with as he progressed through his career. I'll hand over to Dan, enjoy the lecture and come back and watch the rest of our series. Hi there everyone and welcome to my uh, Wallacea lecture. So today I'm going to be talking about a piece of research that I first got involved with for my master's thesis actually back about 15 years ago in the early 2000s um, with Operation Wallacea out in Indonesia. And after I wrote it up for my master's, um, we decided to keep it running and it grew over the years and it developed into quite a big collaboration with all these organisations you can see along the bottom of the slide here, ranging from WWF over in Washington DC, uh, Project Seagrass, and a number of universities in the, the US like Cornell, uh, the UK, Essex, Cardiff, Swansea, uh, and out in Indonesia, um, Hassanuddin University in, in Makassar. It's a piece of research that um, I feel very passionately about, having been involved in, in it for so long. And what it really is gonna talk about is the fisheries that typically exist along tropical coastlines. So these generally are characterized by being small scale, um, often using traditional techniques with the fish primarily feeding local communities um, rather than being sold commercially. Uh, but they support hundreds of millions of people worldwide, so they're extremely important. And they also exploit some of the world's most biodiverse but threatened ecosystems, coral reefs, seagrass beds, mangrove forests. So they're interesting for a lot of reasons and they're, they're important for a lot of reasons. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the complexities of managing these fisheries and why they're such a challenge for conservation. And I'm also going to propose a new way of approaching how we understand them uh, that combines traditional fisheries science, ecology, economics and the social sciences. So hopefully there's something in here for everyone and hopefully you'll find it interesting. If you want to read a little bit more about it and delve more into the science, uh, we published this work last year in, in Nature Communications. Um, it's an open access paper, so you don't need to pay to access it. You can just search for it online, download it and, and read it. So uh, there's the title. You can always email me if you have any questions as well. And if you want to read something a little bit more conversational and um, less scientific, then we also wrote um, an accompanying article for a website called The Conservator Conversation, um, which you can see down the bottom here as well. So do feel free to, to go and check those out if you'd like to. So I'm not going to go into too much background. I want to kind of jump straight into the research. But when we're talking about these kind of ecosystems, you know, I think most scientists agree that our ability to manage and, and protect ecosystems like coral reefs is going to be dependent on our ability and our willingness to address global climate change. However, we also understand that if you manage local threats to those ecosystems like overfishing, then it can build resilience in them. It makes them more resilient to climate change and it buys us time um, as, a, as, a, as a global community to address the more global threats like climate change. And when it comes to fisheries management, gear restrictions is often an important tool for, for conservation managers. Now, when we talk about a fisheries gear, we mean a type of fishing. So gill nets is a gear type, spear fishing is a gear type. Um, and when we talk about gear restrictions, the reason that's so important is around coral reefs and seagrass beds in the tropics, it's not unusual for 50, 60, 70 different gear types to be used at a single location uh, at a single time. They're very, very diverse fisheries. Um, and so the ability of managers to come in and, and pick and choose which type of fishing, which gear should be used and shouldn't be used is a really useful tool, um, especially in, in, in most tropical locations where banning fishing entirely is just not possible. It's completely unrealistic because of how many people locally, how many millions of people um, are relying on those fish for, for their survival and to feed their kids. Um, now, how you choose which gears to manage is often the challenge, and that's really what this, um, this study is all about. Sometimes there are very obvious candidates, and I'll talk about some of those in a minute. Uh, and, and a lot of the time, we know very little about how those gear types actually function. Uh, and a very, very common broad brush approach is to categorize some gear types as being industrial, which is what we would think of being quite high intensity, quite damaging big ships, often providing fish to sell on commercially. And then on the other hand, what we call artisanal gear types. Artisanal just means traditional, 
So these are often um, gear types that have been used for a long time uh, and made using traditional materials and provide food for the local community rather than for uh, selling commercially. But every gear type is different. They all express different characteristics. Uh, their ecological damage, the type of fish they remove, how many fish species they remove, how much bycatch, um, how they fit socially and economically. Um, and therefore, the only real way to direct gear restrictions is to understand all of these different characteristics. And so what we're um, kind of presenting in this talk and in our research is that we need to think about the footprint of gear types. Now, the idea of a carbon footprint is quite a, a, a well recognized term. Now, everyone understands the concept of a carbon footprint or even an, e an ecological footprint. And we need to apply that similar thinking to gear types because every gear will have a socioeconomic footprint. What is its total impact across ecology, economics, and the social sciences? In other words, one kilogram of fish from these ecosystems can be caught in a hundred different ways. And each of those hundred ways will have a different overall impact. And we need to understand what each of those impacts are so that we can direct fishing towards the gear types that are having the, the lowest footprint, the smallest footprint, and away from those that are having the, um, the largest footprint. So when we look at some of the common ways that fishing happens in these locations, at one end of the spectrum, you've got things like spear fishing. So these are local fishermen that go out as individuals with a spear gun. Sometimes they're literally a spear that they stab the fish with. Sometimes they are um, they use elastic bands to, to fire the spear at the fish. And if you think about how this actually works, it's incredibly selective. These fishermen are hunting individual fish. They're selecting which fish they want to, to kill and they're generally going to be targeting larger fish that are going to be more valuable to them as, as a food source. Um, so they can be very selective, pretty much no bycatch whatsoever. They can avoid hunting juveniles and it's quite high effort. So the, the amount of fish you get in return for the amount of effort the fisherman needs to put in is actually quite small, which is why they have to target the most valuable fish. If you move up slightly, you've got a whole range of different net types that can be used, seine nets, gill nets, and netting is slightly higher intensity than spearfishing. You're able to capture multiple fish at one time. You can have more than one person involved at any one time. In terms of selectivity, you can still be reasonably selective. You can encircle particular groups of fish with your nets, but you're likely to catch some others. So bycatch is starting to increase as well. You're also gonna catch quite a large number of fish and the chances of catching juveniles and, and, and smaller fish is increased slightly. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, this is um, something called blast fishing. This has been the poster child for um, damaging fishing around coral reefs for, for decades now. This is where local people tend to use um, homemade fertilizer bombs in glass bottles. They light a fuse, um, which is normally a rag soaked in, in diesel. Um, they light it, they wait a few seconds, they throw the bottle into the water. The bottle explodes and that explosion bursts the swim bladders of nearby fish and those fish float to the surface so they can be collected easily. Um, now you often see fishermen in some of these communities that have lost an arm from this. It's a it's a quite a dangerous way to fish and quite often they haven't gone to this type of fishing by choice. They've been pushed towards it by desperation because other types of fishing is becoming less and less effective. They have no other way to feed their families and they move to, to blast fishing as a way of protecting their livelihoods and their, and their food security. And this is a process called um, Malthusian overfishing, where fishermen are aware that what they're doing is, 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 is not great for the environment, but they are forced to do it and they have very little alternatives. Now, blast fishing has massive side effects and the explosion will rip apart the reef, um, damaging the ecosystem for decades to come. Another similar example is, is cyanide fishing. So this fisherman here has a bottle of, of potassium cyanide poison, and he's looking for fish that are valuable, often for the aquarium trade or the live food trade. So restaurants in parts of the world where they want a fish tank where um, their patrons can choose which fish they want to eat while it's still alive and that fish will be taken and cooked, or people with coral reef fish in aquaria in their front rooms. Um, this is often where they come from. So this um, fisherman will look for the fish he wants, he'll squirt some poison at the fish. Unfortunately, the fish will normally have a few seconds before it's stunned. It will swim and hide into the, the coral and the fisherman will then use a crowbar to rip the coral apart to pull out the fish that it's trying to get hold of. 
take them back to the boat, put them in some clean water, it will recover and the fish can be shipped off um, to market, although with a mortality rate of, of often around 90%. So only one in 10 fish will actually make it to their destination. So as you can see, there's a huge range of types of fishing. And then there are some that we know very little about. So this is called a fish fence, um, sometimes called a flight net, a weir, a serro. Um, they've been used for thousands of years and they're believed to be one of the earliest types of fishing uh, back in kind of prehistoric human times. Um, now, this example here is seen in Indonesia. They're large, they're semi-permanent structures, so they're built in a location and they generally stay there for at least several months. They can be huge, several hundred metres in size. Uh, from above, they tend to be shaped like a Christmas tree. If we look at the next photo, you can see that slightly better. Um, and they rely on capturing fish that are dragged into the net as the tide recedes. And then the fisherman goes out and collects them. And we became really interested in fish fences because we, we, we saw them regularly in Indonesia where we were working. We believed that they were becoming more and more common. We were seeing more and more every time we went back to this location. Um, but we found that there was very little known about them. If you looked for them in the scientific literature, there was nothing. There were a few mentions when there were lists of, of types of fishing, but in terms of how they operate, in terms of their impacts, in terms of their bioeconomics behind them, um, there was basically nothing. So we thought, well, let's start to explore these different avenues uh, and start to build up a picture of how fish fences operate. And our, um, uh, our research kind of grew from there. So the first thing we wanted to know is, is where are they used? There's no point looking hugely into a type of fishing if it's only used in a couple of locations. Um, and we wanted to try and show that fish fences are a, a global phenomena. So the first thing we did is we did a huge literature search. We looked for any mention of fish fences or any of their other names in, in published studies or reports. And we found them mentioned in, in 19 countries spanning the, the three major tropical oceans. We had them on the Western Eastern Atlantic. We had them along East Africa. We had them in the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent, the Indo-Pacific, down into Australia and across into the Pacific Islands. So uh, starting to build a picture of a very widely used fishing technique. Um, there was a bit of a gap in our, in our knowledge in the Caribbean, in the Western Atlantic. Um, one of my co-authors um, went on holiday, on vacation there, um, as we were preparing the paper, and uh, she spotted some in Belize. So we do know that they're used in the Caribbean as well. But one of the interesting things about fish fences is because they're so huge, you can actually see them from space, from Google Earth and, and other satellite imagery. So here's a photo of one from Google Earth in, um, in Indonesia. You can see that Christmas tree shape to them. Um, so we then decided, well, let's look at a few locations that weren't included in the literature. Let's see whether we can find evidence of fish fences being used there from space. And let's look at intensity, because the one thing that all these studies don't really tell us is are they used a lot in these locations or are they are they used quite sparingly? So we looked at five locations in Sri Lanka, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia and the Philippines. And we found not only a fish fence is used there, but they're used incredibly intensively. So each of the dots on these these five maps is a fish fence. And you can see hundreds of them being used around relatively small lengths of coastline. So we're starting to build up a picture here of, of a very commonly used technique, both geographically and in terms of concentration. Now, the rest of the talk is going to be focusing on our study location. So this is uh, around Operation Wallacea's base in Indonesia in the Wakatobi uh, Marine National Park. And we've been looking at fish fences since the early 2000s. So first of all, let's look at how the usage of fish fences has changed over time. So the pink line here shows the number of fences. And when we started this study back in the early 2000s, there were around 38 fences being used around the island that we looked at, which is a 25 kilometre long island called Caladupa. And over the years, the use of fish fences grew and grew and grew until it peaked over 200 fish fences around this same coastline. And it's since stabilised around the kind of 150, 180 mark. Now, the orange line here shows the average length of each fence in metres. And you can see again at the start, they were relatively small, 50, 60 metres long, and they grew and they kind of peaked at around 200 metres in length. And we've seen some as large as, as 250 metres. Now, at the same time as this overall effort was increasing, we also saw a decrease of 50% in the mesh size in these fences. And 
what we mean by mesh size is the, the gap between the, uh, the, the within the net that's used in the fence. So the smaller the mesh size, the smaller the holes, and the smaller the holes, the, the more juveniles are going to be caught and the smaller and smaller fish um, these fences are capturing. So what we're seeing is just a ramping up of the amount of effort being put into fish fences over the past 15 years around our study site. Number of fences, length of fence, and size of mesh, all of those are indicators of effort. And this matched what we were seeing when we were talking to the community. So we conducted two household surveys, one in 2005, one in 2012, where we essentially knocked on doors in all of the fishing villages on the island, and we asked each household, what type of fishing do you primarily use? And in 2005, 7% um, identified as being fish fence fishermen. Uh, and by 2012, seven years later, that had increased to 30%. And this was part of an overall pattern moving from um, less intensive methods like spearfishing, which we used quite commonly in 2005, to more industrialized types of fishing in 2012, fish fences, large nets, and things like that. So there's a clear movement amongst the fishing community towards those types of fishing. Now, to put that into context, if you were to lay all of the fences tip to tip um, that we recorded around Kalanupa Island, and this is Kalanupa Island here, the long one. Um, for those of you who have been to our site, Hoga is the little island off the north coast there. Um, and Kalanupa, to put in context, is 25 kilometers long. If we laid all of those fences tip to tip, you would have a continuous barrier of 28 kilometers around the island. Essentially, you'd be, be able to barrier off half of the entire coastline of Kalanupa. Now, Remember, though, that fish fences aren't a straight line. They're made up of, of different, um, you know, that Christmas tree shape, different arms. And if you were to extend those out, so generally one fish fence has two and a half times its own length in total, total fence, you would be able to encompass the entirety of Kaladupa plus a big chunk of, of, of Hoga because you've got around 70 kilometres of barrier built around um, Kaladupa Island. And that's quite a a frightening thing to think about when you when you consider what those fences are designed to do because they're designed to disrupt connectivity you know the barrier that they provide isn't an accident that's precisely what fish fences are designed to do to take advantage of the natural movement of fish whether that be tidal movements whether that be migrations for important ecological reasons such as spawning but we've known about the importance of, of habitat connectivity for, for decades this idea that fish from coral reefs will migrate onto seagrass beds and they will migrate into mangroves for various important processes like spawning. Um, it's one of the most crucial processes that happens along tropical coastlines and it helps to preserve the resilience of those ecosystems. So what we've now got is a type of fishing that is disrupting connectivity and disrupting one of the most fundamental and important um, processes happening locally um, towards co conservation efforts. So you've got a, a type of fishing that is not only removing fish, which is bad for conservation in itself, but it's disrupting these wider processes that are important for conservation. So we're starting to build up that picture of some of the indirect impacts fish, fish fences might be having. Now, what about some of the direct impacts? Well, we started to look at what these fish fences were doing to the ecosystems they were built on. Now, this photo here, um, shows clearance of seagrass beds. So you can see in the middle of the fence here at the bottom of the photo and areas where seagrass has been cleared. And when we talked to local fishermen, we found that they were even using poison sometimes to kill um, the seagrass, to rip the seagrass out because they believed that clearing the area in and around the fence would improve the number of fish that were being caught. I'm not sure there's any scientific evidence for that being the case, but, but that's what they believed. So you've got direct damage to seagrass habitats which are already being threatened. Now when we look at coral reefs, when the fences have been built on reefs, you can see this halo effect around the fence. You've got a white band running around the edge of the fence. And remember, if this fence is 300 metres long, then you've got a huge amount of area along the edge of this fence. And again, we found that fish fence owners were using poison to go and, and kill the corals around the edge of their fences. Now, these corals will take decades, sometimes centuries to grow, and so killing those is having a massive impact on the reef. And then what about the barrier itself? So, so this is, these are two photos of the same fence. 
On the left, you've got a photo on the landward side, so the closest side to, to land. On the right hand side, you've got the closest side to the open ocean. And on the right, you can see a pretty healthy coral reef system growing right up to the edge of the, of the, of the fence. And then as soon as you move to the other side of the fence, you've got a barren wasteland, essentially, of just dead coral rubble. Now, that's not a coincidence. That's going to be the impact of that fence on, on kind of hydrological movement uh, and the fact that that fence is acting as a natural barrier to ecosystem function. And it's essentially creating what we call an edge effect. You're moving the edge of the reef from where it would naturally be much closer to land to the edge of the fence. So you're losing huge areas of, of coral reef purely by building these, these barriers. And then we looked at, well, what are these fences being built of? And, and the majority of them are built from locally harvested mangrove wood. Um, we then started to do some calculations on the total amount of mangrove wood that would be required to build a single fence. And we found that it would be approximately two tonnes of locally sourced mangrove wood required to build one fence. So when you've got several hundred fences in an area, we've estimated that to build the fences that we found around Kaladupa in 2016, you would need 268 tonnes of mangrove wood to construct them. Now, mangroves are already hugely um, over harvested for construction and for uh, local firewood. So adding this extra threat to them is, is pretty enormous. Um, and what we've been able to show is that fish fences are impacting three distinct ecosystems. And we, we think it's probably one of, if not the only fishing type that we can prove has a direct damaging impact on three separate ecosystems, coral reefs, seagrass beds and mangrove forests. So their impacts are incredibly wide ranging. Now, what about the catches themselves? Well, over the course of this study, we monitored the, the amount of fish being caught by fish fences. Now, the grey line here shows CPUE, which is called catch per unit effort. So it's the weight of fish being caught per fence per day. And you can see that they were quite stable. The catches at around 18 to 20 kilograms per day per fence at the start of this study. And then they completely collapsed. They fell by almost 70 percent um, within the first few years of study. So by the end of the study, nowadays fish fences are only really catching five or six kilograms per day. And that's a massive collapse. Now, also remember that although it, although it may look like those catches have stabilised after that initial crash, remember that the amount of effort being put in to those fish fences has increased because the size of the fences has gone up, the mesh size has gone down. So actually it, it represents a, a continuous reduction in catch over the entire um, period of this study. And we see a similar pattern in, in the number of individuals, the purple line here, uh, which you can see also crashed around the same time. Um, so all the indications are that these fish fences are having a massively unsustainable impact on these fisheries. And one of the most worrying things we saw from our data is the high removal of juveniles. Because you've got such large structures with such small mesh size of, of around a centimetre, you're not really letting many juveniles go. Right back at the start of the study, if we look at the yellow line here, that shows all the fish caught from the from the fish fences, what percentage of them were juveniles. And you can see that it was around 4%, which is pretty healthy. Um, there's, there's no fishing gear that isn't going to catch any juveniles. There's always going to be a little uh, juvenile impact. 4% isn't too bad. But as the study developed, we started to reach around 40 to 50% of fish being caught as juveniles, which is much more worrying. Now, the story became even more bleak when you looked at larger fish species. So the, the green line here is uh, fish species that mature above 15 centimetres, so um, kind of medium sized fish. And the blue line is species that mature over 20 centimetres, so the kind of largest fish. And what we're finding that by the end of this study, the largest fish, which tend to be the most commercially valuable and the most ecologically important, are being caught as juveniles at around 90 percent, which means there isn't really much hope for those species to survive in the long term if fish fences keep being used in such um, high numbers. Now, what about the non-selective elements of them? If you've got these huge 300 metre long structures positioned um, along the, the kind of intertidal zone along these coastlines, the chances are you're going to, you're going to be um, capturing a lot of fish, um, especially as you're working in such a biodiverse ecosystem. Now, 
we're quite lucky here that um, Operation Wallacea and, and its scientists have been working in the area for over 20 years. So we have a pretty good list of all the species that our scientists have encountered over those 20 years. And the good news is we've recorded 324 species of fish uh, in our surveys over the years that we've never recorded in a fish fence catch. So those 324 species would appear to be reasonably um, kind of, um, you know, able to uh, avoid being captured by fish fences. However, there are a further 251 species of fish that we have observed in surveys over the years and we've observed in fish fence catches. Quite a huge number. More worryingly of all, there are an additional 263 species of fish that we had no idea even lived in the area. So species of fish that we've never recorded in, in 20 plus years of surveys in the mangroves, the seagrass beds and on the coral reefs that we did record in fish fence catches. So this brought the total number of species caught by fish fences in this one location up to 514, which is an, uh, an incredible number of species to be caught by a single type of fishing. And this doesn't include what we would call charismatic megafauna, because we also recorded sharks, turtles, dugongs, um, urchins, crabs, sea cucumbers, octopus, squid, lots of other invertebrates also being caught by fish fences as bycatch. So you've got a type of fishing here that is exploiting over 500 species of fish plus countless other um, larger species as bycatch. And when we broke those species down in terms of where we generally find them habitat wise, we found that the majority of fish uh, fish being caught by fish fences are those species that we know move between habitats for spawning, for feeding, uh, to avoid predation. So um, fish that we know use mangrove, seagrass and coral reefs, um, around 90% of them are being caught by, by fish fences, um, which is another indication that fish fences are exploiting these natural movements um, of fish. Now, what about the bioeconomic control? and the economics behind the use of fish fences, because when we started to look into these, we realised that fish fences are, are also unusual in, in their bioeconomics. First of all, they require a, a high initial financial investment. It costs around 400 US dollars to build a fish fence. And for a, a, a local fisherman living in these, these often quite poor communities, that's a lot of money. That's a big investment. So already you're restricting the people who are able to, to enter the fish fence fishery. Um, it's similar to other larger gears such as gill nets, but what's different about fish fences is once you've built a fish fence, the amount of long term effort required to run them is, is very, very small. If you invest $400 in a gill net, you also have to invest hours and hours and hours every day taking that net out, using it to capture fish and bringing them back to land. However, when you invest $400 in building a fish fence, you have to put very little time and effort into it moving forwards. Um, all you really have to do is go out to your fence once a day at low tide, scoop up all the fish that have been caught in the collection end and take them back to, to, to the village. So it's a very what we would call high investment, but low effort gear type, which is um, pretty unique. What this does is it means there's added pressure uh, on fence owners to recover that initial investment. So even if the, the catch starts to decline and they're catching fewer and fewer fish, because they're desperate to recoup that initial $400, there's a higher chance that they will continue to use those fences uh, or at least abandon them. And, and it's not worth the effort going and taking them down. So the risk of, of ghost nets and ghost fences becomes quite high. But there's also an incentive to maintain their operation. Um, so even if you're only catching a few fish per day, because it only takes you an hour to go out and, and, and scoop up those fish and bring them back, there's much more incentive for these fishermen to, to continue using them. So you've got a, a, a very unique type of fishing that costs a lot of money to, to start, requires very, very little investment in time and, and money moving forward. And therefore the incentive for fishermen to keep using them uh, remains quite high. Now, when we try, try to plot this, I'll try and explain this, this graph a little bit. This is um, a pretty standard bioeconomic model. It's called a, a Gordon Schaefer bioeconomic model. And the curve you see on there is a traditional effort yield curve. The left hand side of the curve works along the, the basic principle that the more effort you put into fishing, the more fish you will catch. However, if you keep increasing your effort more and more and more, you eventually get to a point where 
putting more effort in in the long term will lead to lower yields, fewer fish being caught because you're catching fish beyond um, the sustainable limit. And that's what we call maximum sustainable yield, the highest amount of fish that you can remove from a system and the system can continue to replenish through, through natural reproduction. Now, the blue line on this, on this figure is cost. Now, the cost of putting in that effort tends to increase as a, as a straight line. Um, the more effort you need to put in, the more money it's going to cost you because you have to buy a bigger net, you have to buy more petrol for your boat, you have to build a bigger fish fence or you have to build a second fish fence. Um, so cost generally increases um, as a straight line. Now, that point on the graph um, called MEY is what we call maximum economic yield. So this is the point at which um, you have the greatest distance between cost and yield, i.e. it's where your profit is at its highest. And fisheries theory would suggest that a, a commercial fisherman should be fishing around maximum economic yield because that's where they're making the most money for the amount of effort they're putting in. They tend not to, but that's the theory. Now, coral reef fisheries are slightly different because they're what we call open access. So everyone in the community is generally allowed to go and fish in those coral reefs. And that creates something called a race to fish. Um, some of you may be aware, um, maybe um, know of the idea of the tragedy of the commons, where you make a resource open access and allow everyone in a community to, to use that same resource. It's only a matter of time before unsustainability occurs because you've got every member of the community fighting over those resources. And what that means is coral reef fisheries tend to be fished way beyond maximum sustainable yield to what's called the open access equilibrium, i.e. the point at which profit becomes zero. Um, so when you've got a normal kind of type of fishing, a normal gear type for coral reefs, um, they're low investment and they're high regular effort, and they would tend to um, force fishing to occur up to that open access equilibrium. Now, if you add high investment into the mix and you have a type of fishing that is high investment and high regular effort, then theory might suggest that you will actually improve fisheries management slightly and, and force fishing back towards maximum sustainable yield. However, fish fences are slightly more unique because they've got that high investment but low regular effort. It means the overall cost of this effort becomes lower because of your, you're putting less and less time into fishing and actually your cost line is forced slightly further to the right, meaning that fish fences, purely through their bioeconomics, could actually be making overfishing worse by pushing um, fishing effort beyond that open access equilibrium. And then finally, we looked at social conflict and um, how are these fish fences interacting with the community as a whole? Um, first of all, we know that if you're building a 300 meter long fish fence on an area that is normally open access, you're assuming property rights. You're basically saying, I'm the only person that's allowed to fish on this area of reef, and you're excluding other fishermen from being able to fish on that in that area. Now, what we would call that is an unofficial or an unregulated exclusive spatial harvest right. Now, that's something that those fence owners haven't been given, hasn't been agreed with the community. They've just taken it upon themselves to go out and build their fence. Now, that's likely to cause a little bit of friction, uh, a little bit of social conflict. And that's exactly what we found. We found that um, views of local fishermen towards fish fence owners was pretty, was, was pretty low and pretty, pretty negative. But we also found that there was a, a perceived social hierarchy. Now, there are two ethnic groups that live in this part of Indonesia. You've got the, um, the Pulau, the islanders, who are the, the kind of um, traditional Indonesian um, ethnic groups who have traditionally moved from agriculture to fishing over the past few decades. And then you have uh, what's called the Bajau, um, who call themselves sometimes the Sea Gypsies, and they are often seen as second class citizens, unfortunately. And what we found were fish fences were only allowed to be built and owned by the Pulau community, and the Bajau were essentially banned from using them because the Pulau community wouldn't consider the idea of a, a Bajau fisherman having any sort of um, assumed property rights over those common resources. So you've got a type of fishing that not only is leading to social conflict within the Pulau fishing community, but you've also got a type of fishing that is exacerbating um, ethnic um, hierarchies within the, the overall local communities. Now, what we find is that, that all these things undermine co-management efforts. You know, it's, it's pretty well known now that the best co-management uh, has to include all members of the community. You have to get buy-in from 
all aspects of the fishing community for, for management to be successful. So when you've got one type of fishing that is forcing out other types of fishing, then you've got more conflict and you've got less uh, chance of, of successful co-management. So let's put that into context as well. If you were to kind of clump all of these fish fences together, you would get an area of around one and a half kilometres squared that is being um, taken up by fish fences that can't be used for other types of fishing. And that's actually a pretty huge area for, a, for an economy that's entirely reliant on fishing. So it's quite understandable why so much social conflict has, has built up. So just to end with a, a little kind of summary on what we found about fish fences. First of all, we showed that they are used across the tropics in three ocean basin, basins in at least um, 19 countries, plus we found them in Belize, so uh, more than 20 countries. The chances are they're used in a lot more countries than that, they've just not been recorded there. So a type of fishing that is globally relevant. We've shown that they can be over 150 metres long. They remove huge numbers of juveniles thanks to their small mesh sizes. They disrupt ecological connectivity, which we know is one of the most important factors for local marine conservation. We've shown that they exploit over 500 species locally, which is absolutely um, huge. Um, we've shown that they cause direct damage to three different ecosystems, mangroves, seagrass beds and coral reefs, and that that mangrove deforestation is going to be pretty significant with hundreds of tonnes of mangrove wood removed from a single island just to build fish fences. And finally, we showed that the use of fish fences, their bioeconomics and, and the way they assume property rights leads to increased social, social conflict and inequality. So we've used all of these, um, all of these facts to, to call on conservation managers and government to, to consider targeting fish fences with gear restrictions. And I'm really pleased to say that the, the, when we published the paper, it was picked up by a lot of the big um, conservation organisations like WWF. It was also picked up by the Indonesian government and governments in other countries who are now considering using the findings of this research to restrict the use of fish fences, which would have a, a massive impact on sustainability of these fisheries. We also call upon fisheries managers and we propose this new way of thinking about fisheries management along tropical coastlines where you've got so many different gear types being used and that we need to move towards a footprinting approach where we break down the key impacts that these gear types might be having, both economically, ecologically and socially. And we start to build up a picture of which types of fishing should we be promoting because they have the lowest footprint and which types of fishing do we urgently need to manage against and um, because they're having the highest footprint. So thank you. I, I hope that's been interesting. Um, here's my email address and, and my Twitter handle. If you've got any questions, do feel free to um, send them across to me. Always happy to chat about this research. Um, thanks very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the, the Wallace here uh, lecture series and um, I hope to see some of you out on expedition at some point in the future. Thanks.